Uh, my name is Marvi Mazhar. I'm an architect and a practitioner from uh, based out of Karachi. Um, that you all made it to the our fifth session of Plus 9 to 1 Heritage Talks. Um, this is the second round of this uh, webinar. Last year, we initiated this and we had incredible lineup of like 10 to 12 speakers who spoke about infrastructures and cities development. Um, we talked, we focused a lot on heritage and policies, and this year we're talking about moving forward. And we're talking about alliances, we're talking about environmental rights with heritage and preservation rights alongside. Pakistan Chow Community Center came in being in 2016. Um, since then, from uh, talking about interventions and thinking about how to work with the city and with the people, we constantly would like wanted to um, initiate the different conversations around how the development takes place. We've been um, advocate towards larger projects with the government, against the government, with the government, thinking about how uh, new spaces are created and how um, historical spaces are incorporated. Since COVID, we've gone digital, but one of our projects is still going on uh, which is the Heritage Walk Karachi. And now, luckily enough, since last two years, most of our research projects are funded through that sustainable model, where uh, Heritage Walk kind of pays a lot of our sections and bills, uh, especially with uh, students working and giving them a small stipend to kind of you know work and do research uh, with us. So today's session uh, is about talking about through the academic lens and talking about heritage and projects uh, involving the circle of institutions, how they are looking and how they are researching and thinking about preservation projects overall in, in the scheme of South Asia. Our last uh, second, like uh, day before yesterday's session was incredibly amazing. And I would like all of you to, once it gets uploaded, to please have a look at it. It talked about infrastructures of state-based projects like museums, uh, community-led cultural spaces. And over there, we had um, Avni talking about intervention versus embracing projects, talking about radical thinking, talking about going against light-minded issues and light-minded people coming in a room and talking about uh, projects which like, you know, I mean, it was quite an interesting conversation where Sophia Balagamwala then spoke about museum and its literature, what is shown on a public platform and, and these white walls. Whereas Citizens Archive of Pakistan spoke about working with the government and creating this narrative of institutional partnerships and public-private partnerships. So on that note, I will let my colleagues um, lead you in into how the session will start. There are some outlines that they will talk about. And uh, on that note, um, every speaker will get 10 to 12 minutes to speak. Um, of course, you know, one or two minutes can go up and down. Um, then after that, we will have a communal conversation where we will let, uh, if there are any questions from the students or public who want to put it out in the chat box. So please keep an eye on the chat box and respond. And if any links that you would like to share while presenting or after presentation, please populate the chat box. Thank you so much again. And I really appreciate all of you saying yes to our webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello and assalamualaikum everyone. I'm Hamda and I will be hosting today's session with our five wonderful panelists. Thank you so much again for taking our time to be here with us today. Um, on our panel, we have Dr. Ali Reza, Dr. Chris Mofat, Ms. Shahana Rajani, Dr. Ali Usman Kasmi, and Dr. Zahra Hossein. And so getting into it, the topic of discussion today, as you all know, is academia and its role in shaping the city's landscape. So just a little bit of, about the topic before we start. Um, we know that academia's role in knowledge production is important. It influences policy, helps interpret archives, and allows for engagement with diverse stakeholders in the city. But we also know that because of rapid urbanization as a result of neoliberal ideologies, there is a growing threat posed to heritage spaces in terms of their erosion and destruction and even lack of maintenance. And so our primary motivation for this session is to delve into the role of academics and um, the responsibilities of academics amidst these changing dynamics. And the main questions that we're seeking to know more about through this session are, A, how are academics actively rehabilitating heritage? And what tangible results, if any, has come from their efforts so far? 
In addition to that, academia's role in curating historical narratives raises questions about what is worthy of being preserved in archives and therefore what is eventually represented and recorded as history. Um, thirdly, academics and universities, as we know, serve as critical knowledge producers. How then can universities deepen their partnerships and their relationship with cities? And so through this, we basically want to explore the potential for enhancing this very important relationship between universities and the city moving forward. We hope that today's panel can offer us some insight into these questions through their unique perspectives and practices. And in terms of the structure of the conference, I will be introducing our panelists one by one, and then I will invite them to speak each for about 10 to 12 minutes. And just a small note before we start, my, and my apologies, Apologies in advance for this, but in case you do go over time, we may have to give you a gentle reminder just so we have enough time for a Q&A at the end. And with that, I would like to introduce our very first speaker, Dr. Ali Raza. Dr. Ali Raza is an associate professor at LUMS and a historian of South Asia. He received his doctorate from the University of Oxford, and his research and teaching interests include the social and intellectual history of South Asia, comparative colonialisms, anti-colonialism, decolonization, and post-colonial theory. He is the author of Revolutionary Past, Communist Internationalism in Colonial India. His book narrates the lives, geographies, dreams, and anti-colonial struggles of Indian revolutionaries and how they sought to remake the world. In addition to his other scholarly commitments, he is also the co-founder and co-curator of the LUMS Digital Archive. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today, and I will now give you the floor. If you could just please share with us any words or about your work and any insights you have regarding our discussion, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Marvi and Hamda. Hamda, thank you so much for setting this up really nicely. Um, I'm just going by the prompt uh, that uh, we exchanged, that we discussed on WhatsApp and what you just like you recited right now. Um, because I want to begin with a qualifier that I don't work necessarily on heritage or city for that matter. I do teach on them occasionally. Um, I think my colleagues' research is more relevant to those questions. Uh, but going by the prompt and, 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 and the abstract that you shared, um, I thought that it might be better for me to speak mostly in relation to my work with students uh, colleagues uh, like uh, Ali Osman Kasmi, uh, who we both uh, work and, and, and teach in the history department at LUMS, uh, other activists. And I thought that I would speak about our collective efforts uh, to make universities, to make the universities we work and teach in uh, as spaces where intellectual freedom, critical inquiry, and most importantly, uh, dissent uh, is important, uh, is, is crucial. So, um, uh, the first thing I want to point out, uh, or rather to reflect upon, um, is, and um, again, thinking of your prompt, uh, the first thing I thought it might be worthwhile thinking about was to disaggregate uh, the term academia and perhaps separate the academy from the academic. Um, and I say this because uh, academies obviously are institutional homes for academics like us. Uh, they offer us the space that is crucial for teaching and research, uh, but they're also institutions uh, allied with and reliant upon capital uh, and, of course, state power and state logics. Uh, in that sense, they're also complicit in the destruction of heritage, of what we consider to be heritage and indeed the erasure of history itself. Uh, maybe I'll end on that, but uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, point out other uh, things about the history of this of this of this thing that we call uh, academia uh, there is of course a story uh, of the modern and the contemporary university that is to be told uh, from the second world war onwards uh, and that obviously is a story of uh, tremendous success uh, this is when university education really takes off uh, in both euro america uh, and of course the formerly colonized world uh, in Europe and the U.S., uh, for example, there are more students from working classes, uh, women uh, especially, and of course, uh, there are more racialized and uh, discriminated minorities uh, gaining entry into college and, and graduating with, with degrees of higher learning. Uh, in the colonized world, of course, um, there is a state momentum, there's a state impetus, there's a state logic, there's a state need uh, to create uh, more universities and more students uh, in what is ultimately a state-led attempt uh, to catch up uh, with the West. Uh, these are obviously territories that have been systematically been 
uh, underdeveloped um, and, 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 and university education uh, is seen as a huge part of, of that urge, of that imperative to catch up. Uh, so from Ghana to Indonesia, uh, there's a story ultimately of universities like sprouting all over the all over the formerly colonized world. Uh, in our Pakistan, may in our in our part of the world, uh, Karachi University, for example, uh, was established in 1951. Um, Kaidazan University in 1967, and that's not to say okay, pehle universities nahi hoti thi. There used to be universities before as well. Uh, I'm thinking of Punjab University. I'm thinking of uh, Government College. Uh, they have been around since the late 19th century. Uh, there's there was of course a University of Dhaka that's 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 created in the early 20th century, uh, but those universities, those institutions of higher learning, they were few and far in between. And so one story of Pakistan to be told actually is is through this mushrooming of universities, uh, and and Karachi University you know is a good kind of like starting point for that. Uh, and especially in the last two decades, we've seen a mushrooming of institutions of higher learning degree colleges, all kinds of universities uh, that have sprung up, uh, especially after the Higher Education Commission was reconstituted and so on. Uh, so uh, at one level, there is this story ultimately of, again, what 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 one would consider to be uh, an amazing success story. But that is parallel to, um, and that's what I want to emphasize. Uh, and I'm thinking now with Terry Eagleton, he's a prominent uh, literary and Marxist critic, uh, but that story has been parallel to what he has called uh, the slow death of universities. Uh, now, uh, I just want to clarify that uh, that the death of the university, it's somewhat, it has in some ways become a cliche. Uh, ever since the 90s, as far as I have been able to trace, the, the university's death has been uh, loudly proclaimed, especially these days, every few weeks there's an article out. Uh, that that again uh, proclaims the death of the, of the university, <clears throat> and this is a very far cry, I have to say, uh, from the 1970s, uh, 60s, and 70s when universities uh, were the sites, uh, and I would say indeed the very centers of struggle uh, and even revolution in some cases. Uh, we saw a glimpse of that uh, recently, uh, or we are seeing that in the recent campus uh, Palestinian solidarity in campus uh, in Europe, in the U.S., uh, and 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 so if the city at that time in the 60s and 70s, which is also what I also work on, if the city had a space for dissent and subversion uh, and literally for a defiance of authority, uh, whether it was social authority, religious authority, or indeed state authority, that space was okay, the university. Um, and in, in, the, in the context of Pakistan, uh, you know, there's obviously the story of the National Students Federation, the Democratic Students Federation, and so on. And these are students who are at the forefront of agitations against Ayub's dictatorship. Um, and since then, of course, there have been systematic attempts at clawback. And that and those attempts have been in two directions. Uh, and, and I'm thinking of the contrast because uh, I, I've, I've been struck looking at police reports in the time at how universities were seen as by the authorities, what students were thought of as pr pretty much as threats to society, to established order. Uh, and since then, there has been a systematic, as I said, attempt at clawback. And that has been in two directions. And that's a very general comment that I'm just relying on uh, what is now an increasingly talked about point, which is to say that the first direction is that the university is now increasingly uh, a managerial, a corporatist, a service-oriented uh, model institution uh, that relies upon uh, basically conformity. Uh, the second uh, and this is what I want to end on, perhaps. The second, of course, direction is the uh, systematic devaluation of humanities uh, in favor of uh, technical subjects. Uh, and, and, and the way to rephrase that is that there has been a systematic devaluation of the very subjects that are the lifeblood of critical inquiry, dissent, uh, preservation of heritage, um, uh, you know, uh, production on, on, on basically history and so on. Uh, and both I would submit, and again, this is a point that's widely made, uh, both have worked to remake the university as a site where students are consumers, professors are service providers, and both are accountable uh, to an unaccountable class of managers and administrators. And in short, from that age, uh, as I said, the 60s and 70s, uh, when someone like Theodore Adorno was thrown out of his classroom and so on, I mean, uh, you know, universities are now a site of conformity and social reproduction uh, more than anything else. 
And I say this despite uh, the Gaza protests that have been that have inspired us all. And if there's anything that one can say about the protests, again, commenting from afar now, is that they have happened in spite of the university, not because of the university. And already we're seeing attempts by university administrators and those boards of trustees, which have billionaires sitting on them, figuring out how to prevent such things uh, in the future. Uh, the case, of course, in Pakistan is not much different. Um, there, is a, there is a huge split, as we know, uh, between the private and the public sector. That's bad enough. But universities in Pakistan are effectively sites of surveillance. Uh, now, in fact, there are sites of abductions uh, with Baloch students being increasingly picked up uh, across universities in Pakistan, whether it's in Islamabad or Karachi, or, of course, in Balochistan itself. Uh, and there, ha- there are also sites of censorship. Ali Kasmi and I uh, found out about that. I mean, we have, we know about that. But, I mean, our most recent kind of like attempt uh, to uh, to organize a conference, this one on, uh, this was on 1971, uh, was basically effectively shut down by the university establishment. And of course, they were under pressure from uh, the military establishment. Um, and so uh, I, I guess that is to say that I uh, this is a pessimistic reading in some ways of what the university can do uh, to in some ways foster uh, that, that, that spirit of free inquiry, uh, that spirit of critical uh, scholarship, uh, that spirit of dissent. Uh, and I think that that also has a, a a link with how we kind of, you know, relate to and engage with and write about and talk about uh, what you are interested in, which is the question of uh, heritage, uh, because I'm linking that with the systematic devaluation, as I said, of, of the humanities generally. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, we have to also think about what would, what would, what does it mean to work uh, in spite of the university and what kind of obligations uh, that entails. Uh, I mean, Charles Taylor, uh, he recently came out with a book on on, on romantic poetry. uh, And part of what he's trying to figure out over there is to think about how poetry in some ways repairs uh, this this alienation that we have, that we experience as as modern subjects. Uh, And I think that that that, that is very much the function of the humanities as well, which is to uh, repair, if you will, or rather to reconnect uh, and to embed us, if you will, uh, within the context we inhabit. Uh, and I'm afraid, in fact, uh, what the devaluation of what we do in the university means uh, for the cities we also inhabit, because as I said, that this destruction of heritage that you spoke about is not disconnected from the academy. And there is a paradox over here that even we, even, even when we have academics and, and scholars uh, like we have in this panel, uh, Shahana, uh, you know, uh, Ali Kazmi and, 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 and Chris, uh, who, who work on these questions. Uh, we also have our colleagues in some ways who, who work in other departments, uh, from policy to economic development to, 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 to urban kind of like, you know, who, who work on urban questions, uh, who, and, and those departments are in fact complicit in the destruction of heritage itself and the erasure of history too. And so they, they are in some ways complicit in, in cementing this logic as a set of disembeddedness. Uh, and so uh, this is what, in some ways, what I'm trying to point to. Um, and, and so for that reason, uh, maybe I don't hold up too much hope, uh, hold out too much hope uh, from the university as an institution. And maybe that's a pessimistic side of me talking, uh, but that is to say that, uh, that I, uh, I do reflect upon, and, and these are conversations that we have, continually have, of what it would mean uh, to work in spite of the university and what it would mean uh, to create those spaces where again, those conversations are uh, possible. I think I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali Raza, for for um, all of your words. Um, just like a quick, uh, you know, a couple of my thoughts. I, I just think um, what you talked about in the sense of uh, disembedding, uh, in the sense of this uh, de-aggregating um, ac- professors and, ac- and, and people who are academics from academia and from the institution is a very interesting topic, especially because um, as you go away from the institution, as you go away from all of the vested interests and all of the, um, you know, the structures that, um, that are complicit in this erasure and violence, you go towards um, a more holistic re-envisioning of what um, of, of what heritage, what history, what humanity, what, what identity can be. Um, and, you know, 
and you know as a as a student myself you know as someone who's thought about these things it's also a, a great conversation to be had about how we can move toward we can move away from our um we can move away from older methodologies and move towards a more cohesive um relationship with the rest of society in general um and with that like i would just like to hand it over to hamda hamda who will introduce our next speaker thank you yeah um so our second panelist is dr chris mofat um, Dr. Chris is a senior lecturer in history at Queen Mary University of London. He received his PhD from Cambridge University on the anti-colonial revolution of Robert Singh and the way he is remembered in 21st century India and Pakistan, which is what led him to his work in South Asia. He was a visiting faculty member in the history department at Government College University, Lahore, during which he was also involved in a collaborative research project with colleagues and students in architectural and cultural studies at NCA. Currently, he is the editor of The Time of Building, Kamil Khan Mumtaz in Architecture in Pakistan, and co-editor of Lahore in Motion, Infrastructure, History, and Belonging in Urban Pakistan. Um, Dr. Chris, thank you so much for taking time out to join us. And if you could please share with us some words about your work and any insights you have for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Hamda. And um, thank you, Amna, as well, and, and Marvi, especially for um, for having me here and um, I think it's a real uh, privilege to be on this panel about academia uh, and its role in shaping city landscapes. And actually, I think um, it's nice to follow on from Ali because I think I'll pick up on some of the similar um, questions about academics' relationship to authority, to critique these sorts of questions. Um, I am a firm believer in the academics' responsibility to engage wider publics, to refuse this kind of easy, uh, positioning as a neutral or objective observer and instead insist on the um, political stakes of what we write and teach and put out in the world. And I, I am, you know, it, again, it is a privilege to be on a panel here with four scholars who I think uh, epitomize this sense of responsibility, the power of critique, but also of collaboration beyond university uh, classrooms and campuses. And I've, I've learned from everyone here, um, everyone speaking as well as as, as Marvi as, as, as host. Um, I'm in slightly a different position as a scholar who's interested in cities in Pakistan, but who resides in another country whose political and public engagements are, are more plainly directed towards um, North and, and East London, where I kind of live and work. Um, and this distance makes it hard for me to have a kind of grounded uh, relationship to active policy or heritage efforts in Pakistan, even as I try to sustain um, collaborations, and also avoid some of the more extractive uh, and irresponsible tendencies that shape many foreign scholars' engagements with, with Pakistan. And maybe we can talk about that in, in relation to academia as an institution uh, later as well. But because of these distances, I thought I would um, kind of flip the prompt a bit for today's session by rather than talking about um, academia and its role in shaping city landscapes and thinking about city landscapes and their role in shaping academia. And in doing so, I wanna to turn to these questions about authority, uh, expertise, responsibility that I suggested earlier. Um, and I'll say something about my ongoing kind of research uh, work as I do so. So I'll focus on three broad categories, heritage, archives, and maps. So first about heritage, um, which is obviously the key concept behind this series. Um, urban struggles around heritage have, have long made clear that the historical significance of a, of a building or a neighborhood should not and cannot be defined strictly by um, some detached judgment about its uh, quote unquote inherent value, right? Whether that's defined by its age, its representation of a particular aesthetic or style, its association with a particular architect. And instead, scholars learning from urban landscapes have underlined the variety of ways that everyday people make the past meaningful in the present. Um, and often through objects or practices that are generic rather than unique, that shift and change over time rather than remain static, that are used rather than simply admired or observed and protected. And as a result, we've had to kind of constantly expand our understanding of what can be considered heritage, right? And this is a clear theme of these talks. Um, the idea of heritage as a uh, heritage value 
as arising out of what scholars call a material discursive process, right? Rather than something from people collaborating and talking and living rather than something that's associated with an inherent value has implications for how we think about practices of conservation and preservation. Uh, and I wanna be careful here not to dismiss the need for built structures to be preserved, especially if they face dereliction or demolition. Um, and often activists do have to appeal to established languages of heritage to do so, like, like age or aesthetic distinction, uh, uniqueness, right? But I also want to acknowledge that practices of conservation or preservation can often have a kind of freezing effect, by which I mean that they can um, solidify or sanitize and securitize a building uh, or an area as an object for someone to observe, to admire, to, to appreciate. But if the use of a building or neighborhood is part of our calculus around what constitutes heritage value, that we might think about how heritage work uh, can cultivate uh, continued use and significance in the present. And, and indeed, the example that I often give when I am talking about this in other areas is Pakistan Chalk itself, right? As a space that is salvaged and secured in collaboration with local community members, artists, architects, activists who have a stake in this historic place of assembly and its uh, continued, you know, use as a space of assembly in the present, right? So since this is a series about the making of modern heritage, I think it's it's worth pointing out the challenges that are posed by modern buildings uh, and especially their kind of functional nature to conventional practices of uh, heritage, right? Um, the ongoing use of these buildings as residences, as government offices, as university campuses, as um, mosques and other places of worship. and these can't be easily sectioned off for a kind of careful conservation or quiet contemplation. They're deeply enmeshed with the flows and rhythms of everyday life. But it's exactly this public function that provides us an opportunity to rethink about the language of heritage and particularly the, the different ways a building acquires historic value. So is a structure worth protecting primarily because it uh, demonstrates the sophistication of a particular architect? Or might we also take into account the ways that a building serves or creates a community, should arguments for what constitutes the, you know, the most important heritage be bound to notions of aesthetic merit or engineering ability? Or can they also mobilize histories of, of how these buildings are used and adapted by, by the people who live in and around them or work in them? Um, so that's the kind of first thing that I question, set of questions I wanted to raise. Um, the second, moving to this question of archives, um, part of the prompt for this session included a question about the academic's role in hosting and interpreting archival material. And I thought it would be um, worth maybe talking a little bit about my research into histories of architecture in Lahore, precisely because the question of the archive and indeed of its limitations has been central to this project. Um, again, learning from the city landscape, the urban landscape of Lahore, the way that buildings are engaged and used and connected to other structures and infrastructures uh, in multiple and complex ways. Um, looking at this, I began to, to kind of question the conventional methods that historians of architecture are expected to draw on in their studies, namely uh, documentary archives, right? Collections of documents typically related to the practice of a particular architect, compiling their drawings, their designs, their correspondence, their notebooks. Um, and an academic's claim to expertise is often based on their claim to mastering a kind of particular source base, right? So it's not entirely surprising that historians interested in architecture are drawn to the architect as, a, as an individual coherent figure, even if we know that architecture as a practice is shaped by all sorts of different relationships um, with clients, collaborators, construction workers, municipal authorities, um, legal kind of uh, land use regulations, the availab availability of material, funding, all of these sorts of things that are required to make a design a reality. So watching a city like Lahore shift and expand over even the few years that I had the privilege of doing longer term research, um, it seems obvious that limiting histories of architecture to the drawings and materials provided by an architect um, and, and the glossy photos taken after uh, the completion of construction is, is itself, you know, hugely limited, limiting as an enterprise. Um, but then I also started to think about whether or not it's really possible to archive 
in the way that we conventionally think of archives as, as sort of static, um, comprehensive uh, institutions, can we actually archive architecture in any meaningful way? Um, and one of the outcomes of this was uh, the development of some teaching tools around uh, the possibility of an architectural archive in Pakistan, which I trialed um, with collaborators earlier this year at NCA and BNU in Lahore, at IBS and NED in Karachi, uh, and for which I received a lot of, you know, hugely useful, often very critical feedback from students and staff. Um, and I just, I'll put in the chat the, the website for this. Um, hopefully that should, should work if you want. It's still kind of a work in progress, but you can look at the teaching tools. Um, there's also a, a free book there, um, which I mentioned earlier, Shahan had mentioned earlier before the session started on Kamal Khan Mumtaz, which you can download. Um, but one of the things that I, I'm kind of underlining here is that engagement with city landscapes and the people who live in cities forces academics to, uh, you know, expand the nation, na notion of heritage, as I've said, but also um, to push us to define what architectural authorship actually is, right? Beyond a celebration of these kind of lone visionary architects uh, towards instead an appreciation of buildings as, as messy, lived archives of sociality, sentiment, belonging. And again, this has consequences for the academics aspiration to mastery, forcing us to confront, you know, the hugely qualified and necessarily limited perspectives that we can draw out in our research and writing. Um, and then just to move to the final point that I wanted to talk about, which is maps, and I'll just summarize this briefly, you know, maps are also an other icon of of mastery of of objective kind of knowledge quote unquote objective knowledge and clearly maps are are hugely important to all of us not just as scholars or as heritage practitioners but just as individuals navigating the world they are ubiquitous um more so since you know uh, the widespread use of, of, of mobile phones um another project that i've been involved in in recent years has been thinking about the consequences of a new map that was drawn across Lahore, which is the map of the Orange Line Metro train, which uh, many of you will know was opened in 2021, through a very controversial period of construction in which debates over heritage were, were kind of central. Um, and myself and two other collaborators, Amar Maksud and Fiza Sajad, have just finished editing uh, a book on the Orange Line's path, in which we commissioned a different writer to uh, cover each of the Metro's 26 stations, um, I'm pleased to say that two of the contributors are on this panel. So Ali Kazmi and Ali Raza both have chapters in the book. Um, and we learned a lot from this process. Our initial concern was to um, think about how the metro map constituted and directed a kind of new geography, a new urban geography in Lahore, forging new connections, making parts of the city newly visible, bringing them into dialogue when previously they were not. Um, but we were also interested in how this new map uh, was incorporated into existing understandings of space, prior associations with certain neighborhoods, the sense of what it means to belong in a city. And this is why we thought it would be important to bring together 26 different contributors, not all of them academics, but disproportionately so. And even then we collected 26 hugely contrasting approaches to Lahore's urban landscape. And a reminder that while we often rely on maps, their authority is, is hugely contingent. They are always overlaid onto the myriad personal paths that we make through space the associations we develop in urban landscapes, um, and the variant positions of, of class and caste, ethnicity, gender, and more that shape the way we navigate cities. So just to summarize, um, with all of these three categories, heritage, archives, maps, research in urban landscapes um, poses important problems for the claims to expertise and mastery that often distinguish academic authority in wider policy forums, or even in association with political or social movements. And I don't want to you know, end by undermining uh, academics uh, entirely, um, especially as Ali had kind of so eloquently um, you know, uh, made an argument for, for our kind of independent um, uh, purpose, critical purpose. And I, I do kind of want to echo that by celebrating a model of academic practice that recognizes the contingency of our authority or expertise. And where academics position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the public, um, they do so less as experts and more as listeners, collaborators, facilitators. Uh, and in these roles, we must kind of still use our knowledge, the privilege of our training, our access to resources to help draw syntheses, 
uh, facilitate consensus, um, promote critical reflection, but we do this in a way that is part of our own continual process of learning and something that I think is modeled by the members of this panel in which um, I also uh, aspire to. So I'll, I'll finish there. Um, and just uh, to respond to the, the comment in the um, chat, uh, BB Hydra also has a chapter in, in the Orange Line book. So look out for it, it should be out later this year or early next year. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moffat, for your insights. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, just something I'm, before we transition into the next speaker, something I'd want to point out about what you talked about that I thought was particularly interesting and important is that heritage work isn't only about the aesthetics of a space and that public functioning is an important part of the calculus. So questions about the impacts of these spaces and what it means to preserve the actions that was that were existent in those spaces is both important and I think particularly interesting. Because especially when you talk about places like Pakistan Chalk, like you brought up, when you discuss with people who live in that area what the space meant to them, it's not only what the space looked like that is important to them, it's the emotions it evoked, right? So as a space to discuss, etc. And I think that's important. So thank you for those thoughts. I'll pass it back to Hamza to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Um, our third panelist is Ms. Shahana Rajani. Uh, Ms. Shahana is an artist whose work traces the visualities, landscapes, and infrastructures of development, militarization, and ecological disturbance in Pakistan. Community-based and collaborative approaches to research are central to her practice. She is a co-founder with Zahra Malkani of Karachi La Jamia, a nomadic space that moves outside the institution to build solidarity with ongoing struggles in the city. Um, Ms. Shahana, you have the floor if you could just tell us about your work and offer more insight into our discussion. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just... Uh, thank you all for having me here today and for organizing this really... Um, yeah, an event that really touches upon a lot of things that I've been thinking about in the past year. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so when I got the invitation to participate in this talk, I was immediately, I immediately knew what I wanted to share because it's research that I've been doing these days and really thinking through. And at the heart of the research has really been this question of the relationship between uh, the university and the city and really thinking about the ways in which universities and knowledge production are uh, having really material consequences for the ways in which we are viewing relating to the city and also the ways in which the city is transforming. Um, as the intro said, I'm an artist, so I really will be taking a sort of visual studies angle on this and really thinking about the role of visuality in relation to knowledge production and in relation to city and also heritage. Um, let me see. Okay, great. Um, so for the past uh, almost 10 years now, I've been running this pedagogical project with a friend of mine, Zara Malkani, and together we have We've been thinking about, I think, to a great extent, what Dr. Ali Reza was saying in the beginning of the systematic devaluation of knowledge production, critical thinking, of radical pedagogy. Uh, and yeah, we're, we've been working to think of ways, alternative ways of, of learning, alternative ways of reconnecting to the city uh, in the ways that we were really feeling that the university has severed our connection to urban space. We began this project uh, at a time when we were really experiencing in Karachi an immense militarization of urban space, but also uh, a really visceral militarization of the universities and knowledge production, where it was really feeling, again, you know, surveillance, censorship, uh, the kind of work we wanted to do, the kind of community we wanted to build just wasn't possible within the space of the university. So we sort of decided to go outside institutional walls and create this nomadic space where uh, every year or so we organize events, courses uh, to connect with 
struggles around land in the city specifically. Um, most recently, we have been doing research and thinking about the education city, the Sindh education city. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is being built on the outskirts of the city. It's a project that's been launched for many years, but now it really seems to have picked up pace. It's nine over 9,000 acres of land. Um, I think all big in educational institutions in Karachi have land over here. Um, but what we've really been learning is that in this area, it's the, 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 the neighborhood is called Chuhar, De Chuhar. And in this area, um, are located about 40 indigenous villages, pastoral fields, agricultural lands, all of which have been uh, through either intimidation or through illegal occupation being occupied. Uh, and so it's really kind of got us to think about the history of our educational institutions, higher education specifically in the land grab. Uh, and through that thinking about if the university is so complicit in the occupation of land, then by its very nature, it will be producing and supporting and legitimizing the kinds of knowledges and relations that perpetuate similar ways of thinking. Um, and just to give you an example of the fact that yes, in the education city, what it's doing is not a new thing at all. Karachi University, which someone I think mentioned gets made in 1951, um, is also actually built on uh, indigenous land. It is built on pastoral commons. It used to be the most um, important pastoral uh, land for not just communities in Karachi, but also adjacent and around Karachi. Uh, and Again, so so yeah, so I just really been thinking about these questions of how the university has been really complicit in uh, this kind of really bordered property and and the accumulation and production of of securitized militarized spaces. Um, and I guess to as a way to connect it with, Academia, knowledge production, what is what does this have to do with uh, our talk? Um, what I wanted to share was that the enclosures of land are really, really closely intertwined with the enclosures of knowledge. So the enclosures of land and the occupation of land in and around the city is accompanied by enclosures of knowledge, by which I mean um, delimiting the ways in which we think, relate, visualize, connect with the land around us. Uh, so when it comes to Karachi, uh, all of the peripheral land on the outskirts of the city since a long while has always been visualized as banjar gairabad gairmefuz, right? As empty land, as something that no one inhabits, even though these are fully inhabited spaces that have been inhabited long before 1947. Um, and this is just an image that I wanted to share to get us thinking of that kind of uh, the role of the blank space or how loaded the empty empty space of the map is, right? And imagining that anything, this land is there waiting to be developed. And what Education City is doing is eerily similar to Beria Town, to DHA City, right? They actually form a triangle on the outskirts of the city. Malir Expressway, which is this really destructive uh, infrastructure project that's being built, is being built to facilitate all three of these institutions. So the university is actually really partnered with uh, some really evil real estate uh, development projects and is doing really similar things at the end of the day. Uh, and when in all the work that I've been doing, every time I sit down with indigenous activists and we are looking at a map, I've always been so surprised that no one is ever going to go into the center of the map. Everyone's attention is always at the margins. That's all they're in interested in seeing because they want to see what has been cut out of the map. And they are constantly bringing my attention to the fact that the peripheries of the map are always, always mapped as uh, blank space. Uh, and that how their 
settlements, their heritage, their histories, their ways of life are never given representation in a map. And that has really um, material consequences for, for the way in which development gets done, right? Because the map helps to legitimize this idea that nothing is there, nothing is being destroyed. Barrier Town, Education City, it's all great. Let's support these projects. So yeah, in thinking about how is knowledge production um, transforming our relationship to the city, I'm just thinking about every time as academics, as writers, as artists, we pick up and reproduce a map, um, right? What What is, we are in some ways also complicit in this erasure of, or in, or we get invested or tangled up in a very particular representation of the city uh, that is serving the needs of a few, right? Or is showing us the narrative that people in power want us to see. Uh, so yeah, this is just a close up of, um, this is the, the highway. So this is showing G Gada, where Beria town is, uh, doing its construction. I mean, it's already done its construction, but you can really see that the map completely has erased everything. Um, so yeah, even in thinking about heritage, like the communities here have no recourse or very little recourse um, to going through legal processes to save their sites and save their histories because the occupation, the raising, the bulldozers, the police, everything is just so quick and it's been so overnight that the city is actually being destroyed to, to reproduce the blankness of the map. Um, and the other thing, the other kind of map that I've been thinking a lot about is also the terror maps of Karachi and how they have also really had a really strong impact on the way that we relate to certain neighborhoods and the ways in which we imagine our own city. In 2013, when the Karachi operation starts, it um, right before the operation is really when a lot of GIS mapping gets popularized in especially in English newspapers, Dawn Tribune. Uh, and you re I really noticed around then this proliferation of these terror maps, which are constantly um, marking in red certain zones of the city. Um, and those zones, of course, then are the ones that are targeted by the next, by the military, oper the Karachi operation that happens. And the rhetoric that these maps help to create is yes, of course, these spaces are really unsafe. They're really dangerous. They're Gare We must let the, the rangers come in and um, secure and make safe these spaces again. And Gadab, of course, is a really key neighborhood in the Karachi operation. And following the Karachi operation, soon Gadap is then opened up to real estate uh, development and occupation. Um, so yeah, I just, and I, again, these maps we come across and I've come across in so many books, right? Where um, again, a really important argument is being made, something really interested, is interesting is being said about the city, but the map then is used as a new, neutral object. Um, and I feel like, no, the map is a really, really loaded image that um, has really violent consequences for communities who are being either represented or not being represented. Uh, and I feel like that in turn has a big consequence for the ways in which we relate to the heritage of the city. Because if a place is just not in our, if a place is shown to us as Banjar and Gerabad, of course, we're not going to think that there's heritage there worthy of preserving. Um, yeah, so this is some just thoughts and ideas. This is a map of Beria Town. Um, and again, in part, it was so easy for Beria Town to project its fantasies onto Gadab because there was this really long precedent of the state and private developers continuously convincing folks of Karachi that there is nothing here. And it's so easy to lean into this fantasy also. Uh, thinking about, I guess, counter, counter mapping. Um, I have a difficult relationship with that word, but of course, um, sometimes you've got to use it. 
And so this is a map of the uh, of that Parveen Rahman was working on, uh, OPP RTI, the Rangi Pilot Project Research Training Center, and it's doing exactly the work that um, these other maps were hiding, where this map and this organization and the work that Parveen Rahman was doing was to make visible, to populate, to reinscribe the blankness of the map and tell the state, tell people, tell developers that these spaces are not empty. So vis visuality mapping representation was really a high stakes game with which we all know, right, that Parveen Rahman paid with it for uh, with her life. Um, but again, to say that in in the work that me and Zara have been doing with Karachi La Jamia, yes, the university has become uh, really uh, surveilled, censored, difficult space in which to do work and to produce discourse that feels meaningful, but around us are so many incredible community-led and alternate uh, pedagogical uh, organizations, initiatives, um, and I think we tend to, I, I often, in my pessimism and feelings of hopelessness, tend to forget that I am not isolated and I am not alone in the work and in my interests. And there is actually so much to learn from community organizations who have been doing really, really crucial work uh, around us. And I did... I did want to be careful about ending on a positive note and thinking about, yes, that there is so much of the city that is being destroyed, especially Sindhi and Baloch uh, histories and heritages and settlements. Uh, but there are also, there is also uh, worlds of beauty and abundance that exist and survive amidst annihilation. Uh, and amidst vast erasure, amidst, amidst vast violence, uh, in places where people and communities have no recourse to state heritage preservation or in places where the state is really not even interested is actually, it has so much to gain from uh, destroying those sites and those histories. I really also found that communities really come up with some really beautiful, incredible means of survival, adapting. Uh, and this is just an example of uh, murals in Ibrahim Hedri, which is a fisher folk settlement in Karachi. Uh, and these murals are kind of like maps. And a lot of these murals feature a shrine in the Delta, in the Indus Delta. And these shrines, um, have either been uh, submerged by the sea or communities have been forced to leave their homelands because the river is no longer there uh, and people no longer live next to their shrines. They, you know, hours and hours away and have had to move into Karachi. And in this way, I found that a really interesting practice through which people are I guess, quote unquote, preserving their cultural heritage, their sacred heritage, is through painting images and maps of uh, their shrines and their ancestral homelands that are really disappearing under the weight of the sea. And so the image takes on a really a new kind of resonance and a new kind of responsibility in these contexts also, uh, where people on whom the map has been used to enforce erasure are, are finding ways also of self-representation and ways in which to continue to find a sacred relation to their homelands and their shrines. And then the image becomes this really uh, incredible, active, alive um, medium for them to do that. So yeah, I'm going to stop here. Thank you so, so much for that absolutely lovely presentation. Uh, just a couple thoughts. Um, uh, you you articulated, um, you know, about visuality and about mapping. So I'll, um, I don't have anything to add to that, but two things that I thought were very interesting that maybe even be relevant to some of our other panelists are, um, you know, uh, when, when you talked about uh, alternatives and um, how we can envision alternatives. Um, I, you know, I think Dr. Chris has also, you know, said something about it, about this in, in an interview of his that I read 
but that's such an important concept especially for you know speaking as a student especially for students especially as young people because we get fed this idea that what what just what is is and the methodologies and the status quo that exists today it just you know exists um and to kind of like go against that narrative requires a contextualization uh, you know of the politics that surround how we've gotten here um and um and yeah and and to to find alternatives for that uh, we also kind of like there needs to be recognition, perhaps not a like a not not a going towards, but at least a recognition and a, a reowning or a re repurposing of the indigenous knowledge that we ourselves um, possess and perhaps do not uh, you know use that much in our daily lives. Apart from that, you uh, you mentioned you know enclosures of land and therefore uh, kind of like delimitation of knowledge. Uh, you know. As someone um, who has seen, you know, development in Karachi today, you know, today, uh, as someone who is a student, in, like a university student right now, that's such an interesting concept, especially because you have uh, this limitation of knowledge, limitation of land uh, that further kind of like leads to um, this is kind of antithetical to community and community spaces, right? Because you can't, you know, if you put a fee on something, if you put a purpose, if you put a, you know, timings on something, uh, if you put only certain people can go here, right, then it's exclusionary, obviously. And then when it's exclusionary, it's always to the exclusion of a very particular, like particular types of people, particular communities of people, uh, and then divisions are created. Uh, and then structures, these, um, you know, exploitative structures stay in place. Uh, so I just thought, you know, and, you know, we can see this in grid planning, uh, we can see this in the way our houses, our schools, et cetera, all of them, uh, you know, how they're structured. Uh, and I just think even the work that Pakistan Chow community, you know, even the work that we're doing is very relevant to this. So I just thought that, you know, it was very applicable to what uh, a lot of us feel, students or academics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. I mean, your work really reflected upon like how we all are thinking about the city and also thinking about periphery as a, and, and then bringing up the dreamscapes of thinking of alter way of looking and visualization. So yeah, it really resonated and kind of looked at into land rights and indigenous information and knowledge, how that works in the idea of development. And of course, uh, the outskirts are always considered as a development land. It is always considered as if you, I mean, we've been doing this work where we are creating a uh, Excel sheet on all the real estate developers and then going to their websites and looking at these incredible 3D works that they've been posting. And it's a very like, you know, I mean, these, these websites don't come up in the usual Google search, but it's only when you look at tender documents is when you look at these footnotes and look at 3D models of how uh, the outskirts in, in a quote unquote are visioned by these real estate developers pitching to the government as a public private partnership and thinking about five year fiscal model. Every June, the money relapses and thinks about another 3D model of the same area. Just kind of like looking at these layers of 3D models every year is just mind boggling. And, and that mm -hmm. itself is such a huge study to look at and, and reflect upon. So thank you again. I won't take much time, but let's talk about this in the last, last section. Um, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Ali Osman Ghasmi. Um, born and raised in Lahore, Dr. Ali Osman is a historian of modern South Asia. He has published extensively in his area of expertise, including three monographs. His recent book, Qom Mulk Sultanate, Citizenship and National Belonging in Pakistan, won the American Institute of Pakistan Studies Book Award for 2024. Since 2012, he has been teaching history at the Lums University School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, Dr. Ali, if you could please share some words with us about your work and anything that you have to contribute. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to to join this conversation. Or I was listening to my um, and you know, I was smiling as well because you know, um, especially when Shana was talking about uh, education city and uh, um, you know, so it reminded me that in Lahore, mein at least jitni bhi, um, uh, universities, hai, including Lums, I mean, Lums also used to have a housing society like 30 years ago. At least they planned one. Um, and, and then, um, you know, government college, FC college, Punjab University, all of them, they've come up with housing societies of their own. And obviously, uh, sari ki sari jo hai, wo isi peripheries or unke margins, city ke margins ke upar wo, um, uh, develop ho rahi hai. Uh, so, main, uh, mera, uh, जो जो काम है वो वो बुनियादी तौर पर एंड इट्स 
it's it's part of a course which I teach, and I will be teaching that course uh, next semester as well. Um, or ये uh, course uh, uh, पढ़ाने से पहले एक दो दफा बल्कि जब uh, जो जो मारवी जो जो uh, जो walk curate उन्होंने की है पाकिस्तान चौक जिसके नाम पर ये सेमिनार हो रहा है was was incredibly helpful. Uh, in addition to that, अनपमा राव का काम और और लोगों ने जो वो भी जो सिमिलर कोर्सेस पढ़ा रहे हैं इतमान नान अहमद सो आई फाउंड दैट वेरी यूजफुल एंड सो माई वट आई वॉन्ट टॉक अबाउट इज के एंड इन सिंस द थीम इज द रोल ऑफ ऑफ अकेडेमिया और अकेडेमिक्स सो हाउ इज इट दैट थ्रू आर एडवोकेसी टीचिंग रिसर्च वी कैन हेल्प इमेजिन द सिटी और हेरिटेज इन अ डिफरेंट वे एंड थिंक अबाउट अल्टरनेटिव काइंड ऑफ लाइक पॉसिबिलिटीज राइट So, एक जो 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 जाविया है शहर को देखने का या शहर की तारीख को देखने का या उसकी सकाफत को देखने का वो ये है ये एक हिस्ट्री बाय नाइट टूर है जो के जो के वॉल सिटी ऑफ लाहौर अथॉरिटी करवाती है वॉल सिटी जी और बल्कि अब इसका नाम बदल के वॉल सिटी ऑफ पंजाब शायद कर दिया गया है इसका जो दायरा कार है वो पूरे प्रोविंस तक फैला दिया गया सो उसमें यू नो इट्स it's a it's a it's a it's a form of a consumption right you pay a certain kind of money and then you uh, they they sort of like uh, is a is a proper kind of like a curation of a specific kind of history ke jisme aap dekh sakte hain ki rangila riksha jisko wo kehte hain so us rangila riksha par baith kar aap shahi qale mein dakhil hote hain roshnai darwaze se wahan se there are certain landmarks of uh, of pakistani quote unquote history uh, linked with mughal history जिसमें इकबाल भी है जिसमें बादशाही मस्जिद भी है और देन यू नो द द इम्पीरियल द सॉवरन पावर व्हिच इज द फोर्ट और उसमें से फिर नेविगेट करते हुए द एंड पॉइंट इज के शीश महल में एक एक क्लासिकल कथक की परफॉर्मेंस होती है वेयर यू आर ऑफर टी अलोंग विद स्नैक्स सो दैट्स वन वे राइट सो इट्स वन कैन हैव ऑब्वियसली यू नो आप लोग ज्यादा बेहतर इसके इसको समझ सकते हैं एनालाइज कर सकते हैं क्रिटिक कर सकते हैं एज एज हेरिटेज स्पेशलिस्ट बट आई मीन वन कुछ से दैट पीपल ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड यू नो दे लुक फॉर दिस काइंड ऑफ कंजम्पन राइट सो इट्स नॉट समथिंग विच इज विच इज पिक्यूलियर टू लाहौर और वट द वर्ल्ड सिटी अथॉरिटी इज डूइंग इस्तमोल में भी आप जाए या बाकी जगहों पर भी जाए तो वहां पर भी लोग ये काम इसी तरह का एक एक क्यूरेशन नजर आती है बट देर इज लाइक ऑल्टरनेटिव नाउ यू नो रूट्स विच हैव वॉक्स विच हैव कम अप पीपल लाइक द मुर्गाजी एंड अदर्स जो खुद से और लाहौर का खोजी जो हमारे एक दोस्त हैं फैजान नकवी तो वो बहुत सारे लोग अपनी भी एक लोगों को वॉक्स पर लेकर जाते हैं चाहे वो सिख हेरिटेज इन लाहौर है चाहे वो रेवोल्यूशनरी हिस्ट्री ऑफ लाहौर है या इस तरह की और चीजें सो आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू टॉक अबाउट दैट द पॉसिबिलिटीज ऑफ लुकिंग एट द सिटी थ्रू दीज साइट्स एंड आई हैव आइडेंटिफाइड थ्री मेजर साइट्स स्टोरीज थ्रू विच टू सॉट ऑफ टू एक्सप्लोर टू एक्सप्लोर द सिटी एंड टॉक अबाउट इट एंड विच इज पर हैप्स डिफरेंट फ्रॉम दिस काइंड ऑफ कंजम्पन बिकॉज इट विल हेल्प पर हैप्स open up uh, different ways of connecting with the city and its past right so isme jo pehli ek jo teen stories hain jisme se main pehli story aapke sath share karna chahta hu wo hai about a statue jo lahore mein lawrence statue ke naam se exist karta tha aur ye statue jo tha wo lahore mall road jo jo log aap mein se waqif hain wo jo lahore high court hai lahore high court aur gp uske bilkul opposite ये स्टैचू हुआ करता था ऑफ जॉन लॉरेंस और इस इस स्टैचू की खास बात ये थी कि इसके एक हाथ में तलवार थी और एक हाथ में कलम था और उसके नीचे एक इंस्क्रिप्शन थी कि क्या तुम तलवार के की हुकूमत पसंद करोगे या कलम की एंड विच वाज कंसीडर्ड टू बी अ वेरी ऑफेंसिव काइंड ऑफ लाइक अलोनियल सिविलाइजेशनल सुपीरियरिटी काइंड ऑफ लाइक पेडागोजी वाला जो स्टेटमेंट था उसको लोग समझते थे और बहुत डिमांड थी कि इस बुद्ध को गिरा दिया जाए एंड इवेंचुअली 1925 में अक्टूबर 1925 किसी ने ये जो 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 बुद्ध था इसकी 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 तलवार और इसका कलम दोनों तोड़ दिए और उसके बाद से ये स्टैचू वहां पर मौजूद रहा लेकिन चूंकि इसका हाथ तोड़ दिया गया गए थे 
तो इसलिए लोग इसको आ, किसी और नाम से पुकारते थे और 47 के बाद आ, इस बुत को यहाँ से उठाकर पहले तो आ, फोर्ट में रख दिया गया और फिर वहाँ पर लेकिन जो जो जिन लोगों को जिन राज का नोस्टैल्जिया था दे दे इंसिस्टेड दैट यू नो इट्स सच एन इम्पॉर्टेंट रैलिक ऑफ आर इम्पीरियल पास्ट इट शुड बी ट्रांसफर्ड टू इट्स प्रेफरेबली इट शुड बी प्रिजर्व इन पाकिस्तान इफ नॉट फिर आप इसको नॉर्दर्न आइलैंड भिजवा दीजिए हम इसको वहाँ पर जहाँ उस स्कूल में रखेंगे जहाँ से लॉर्ड लॉरेंस ने पढ़ा था सो सो दिस इज यू नो सो देन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी वन में कहीं इस बुत को वहाँ से uh, हटा दिया गया और इसको पाकिस्तान से मुंतकिल कर दिया गया और ये इंग्लैंड में चला गया विद दिस कंडीशन के uh, के जो ये जो इंस्क्रिप्शन है जो ऑफेंसिव इंस्क्रिप्शन uh, uh, है वो रिस्टोर नहीं की जाएगी ना सो आई आई थिंक ऑफ इट आई 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 थॉट अबाउट दिस दिस इंसिडेंट जब वो पूरी मूवमेंट चल रही थी जिसमें रोड्स मस्ट फॉल और बीएलएम में के बाद जब जब स्टैचूज गिराए जा रहे थे अमेरिका में इंग्लैंड में एंड एंड आई एंड देर वाज दिस डिस्कशन अबाउट हेरिटेज एंड प्रोटेक्टिंग हेरिटेज एंड आई आई मीन माई अंडरस्टैंडिंग वॉज दैट यू नो इट इज पार्ट ऑफ आवर एंटी कलोनियल um legacy like the history of that anti colonial legacy and movement ke jisme but todna is an act of politics and this is something which is uh, which is a legit form of of doing politics or doing anti colonial uh, politics or expressing against the coloniality of power in all forms and shapes right and so 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 i mean and this is um तो 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 लॉरेंस का वहां पर होना और फिर लॉरेंस का बुत टूटना और लॉरेंस के बुत को की जगह का खाली होना आई मीन दीज आर ऑल पार्ट ऑफ द ऑफ द स्टोरी ऑफ ऑफ दिस सिटी व्हिच नीड्स टू बी व्हिच इज वन ऑफ द वेज थ्रू व्हिच वी कैन अप्रोच रिमेंबर एंड राइट अबाउट द द सिटी ओके सेकंड आई यू नो सो दिस इज पार्ट ऑफ अ प्रोजेक्ट व्हिच आई डिड विद माय स्टूडेंट्स जब हमने ये लाहौर वाला कोर्स किया था जिसमें they were working on um, on various aspects of lahore's history and they were looking at two murders which took place uh, at the same time um, um, and and two people doing different kinds of politics towards the late 1920s one of them was ilamdeen who killed rajpal uh, and the other one was bhagat singh who killed uh, a british officer now imagine that both of them they both of them जहाँ पर उनकी पॉलिटिक्स थी जहाँ वो पैदा हुए पैदा तो खैर भगत सिंह फैसलाबाद के आसपास हुए लेकिन जहाँ यू नो देर लाइक दे स्पेंट मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम और दिस विच सर्ट ऑफ लाइक वॉज सेंट्रल टू देयर पॉलिटिक्स वो सारे का सारा एरिया एक स्क्वेयर माइल में है राइट के के दिस इज ब्रैडले हॉल Bradley Hall is where Bhagat Singh was inspired jahan par National College tha jahan par wo inqilabiyon ki taqreer sunta tha ye wo Mochi Gate ka wo ground hai jahan par Ilm Din was inspired because he listened to a speech by Atullah Shah Bukhari and he decided to kill Rajpal this is Rajpal's shop in Anarkali still exists yahan par smuggled indian goods bikte hain and both of them you know in ka trial bhi lag matlab lahore high court ya iske aas pass ki kisi special tribunal ki building mein hua and eventually both of them were were uh, um, were hanged to death um, and their their remains were either brought to lahore in case of uh, ilamdeen buried in lahore in case of bhagat singh they tried to sort of like hurriedly you know take it away or usko lahore ke thoda bahar nazar aate sh kiya so ye jo ek ye ye jo ek urban geography hai uh, 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 inki inki jo inki politics se connect karti hai i think that is for for me is is a very important sort of like uh, uh, a way of uh, of 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 understanding both of them you know that they both are the products of the same age 1920s they are both doing different kinds of radical politics right and how do we remember or make sense of their radical respective radical politics by connecting with these spaces um and 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 you know so that's you know that that was the uh, uh, part of the project that we were doing lastly and you know a lot of it is uh, as as a bor uh, uh, borrowing from 
from Chris Moffat's work and his uh, methodology and conceptual categories like ruin, like ontology and this and that. Uh, and also this this image, which is of uh, the unfinished um, Lahore monument uh, commemorating the partition of uh, uh, the refugees who Lahore mein aaye the or Walton camp mein rahe the. Anyway, so so ye jo, jo, jo ruins hai, ye jo, or, you know, so like how is it that these uh, ruins they they remind us of of a past which is not really past basically. And which is which is still is or uski jo we are constantly reminded of their unfinished business of their lingering so to speak, in terms of in the form of structures, in the form of like uh, their legacies, in the form of their properties, in the form of their uh, endowments, and so on and so forth, and and how then there is. A, a deliberate kind of like an attempt at a forced kind of like amnesia uh and despite all of that you know they they, they still uh, st uh, are there ab ye jo tasveer hai i find it very interesting lahore mein krishna nagar ki jo abadi hai although krishna nagar ka naam badal kar islam pura rakh diya gaya hai but um, uh, mostly people still call it krishna nagar or they call it krishna nagar islam pura so this is a park which is named after uh, nehru kyunki ye wo jagah hai उसका नाम नेहरू पार्क है एक आध बोर्ड है लाहौर में जहां पर आपको नेहरू पार्क लिखा हुआ नजर आ जाएगा बट बट द फैक्ट दैट द यू नो नेम नेहरू हैज बीन अरेस्ट इज 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 दैट काइंड ऑफ प्रेजेंट एब्सेंस दैट आई आई वांट टू टू टॉक अबाउट एंड एंड एज टू व्हाई इट इज इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट दैट एंड दैट in in our sort of like uh, understanding of the city or our knowledge production um can help imagine a different kind of history can help uh imagine different kinds of policies when it comes to heritage and that this heritage can be that of uh, um uh, can be more inclusive inclusive not in the in a very artificial uh, kind of like way in which um the 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 history by night tour imagines lahore to be a, a melting pot of sorts no, no not that kind of a history um but uh, but you know of uh, of the, the the cultural significance of and the contributions of these hindus and sikh communities and christian communities um and their everyday lives in lahore and also account for the the radical anti colonial politics um um um, um uh, जिसके लिए लाहौर मशहूर था और और जिसके लिए ये साइट्स जो जो अभी भी एग्जिस्ट करती हैं और जिन साइट्स को नाउ दैट दे आर बीइंग रेनोवेटेड को यूज किया जा सकता है फॉर लेट्स से फॉर सेटिंग अप अ म्यूजियम ऑफ सॉर्ट्स टू कमेमोरेट टू सेलिब्रेट टू रिमेंबर यू नो दैट एस्पेक्ट ऑफ रेडिकल एंटी क्लोनियल पॉलिटिक्स जिसके लिए लाहौर मशहूर था Uh, और जिसके ऊपर अली रजा का भी काम है क्रिस पोफट का भी काम है और लोगों का भी अपर्णा वैदिक का भी काम है सो दिस इज आई थिंक दिस इज माय वे ऑफ प्रपोजिंग एज टू हाउ एकेडेमिक्स कैन हेल्प यू नो एंड एन इम्पैक्ट पॉलिसीज रिलेटिंग टू टू हेरिटेज आई स्टॉप हियर थैंक यू Thank you, Dr. Kasmi, for your insights. That was really great. Uh, just a couple of things I'd want to talk about before we pass it on again to the next speaker is I find it particularly interesting this idea about how citizens engaged with the spaces around them, especially at the time in the past when you're talking about places like the Lawrence Statue, and I especially like the connection with the BLM movement, which is a more modern example that people might understand and relate to. That these sort of anti-colonialist engagements with the past or these engagements with history that doesn't perhaps uh, you know put these citizens in the best positions is oftentimes uh, pushed against by the citizens with these valid forms of politics when they're bringing down these statues and it's something that is, should especially be commemorated or remembered in the renovation of these spaces and the histories i think that's particularly true and stuff as well when you're talking about the ruins of these mandirs as well when you're looking at these spaces around in lahore and you can see that there's a very deliberate attempt at making sure that these structures aren't constructed or that their construction is one that's sort of left in the middle of the process i think they can evoke a lot of emotion and sort of understanding how these places and how these communities are sort of 
left out of the current creation of space that we have in cities like Lahore and we have in cities like Karachi. Um, that those are my thoughts on the matter. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kasim Sahib. Aapke saath bahut, we've discussed a lot of things shuru mein, jab Heritage Walk ke bhi baare mein baat ho thi. And one thing really resonated, Abhi, jab hum, I was looking at your work, was um, the time, how, how heritage is considered as like a frozen point, but rather looking at it from the aspect of going on, in making, uh, what's next. And I think that is a very crucial point for our subject right now, that how you continue working with the past. Um, that is really critical. And I think Sheher uh, Kobi from lens of how the city itself acts as a museum. Um, that itself is such an important thing rather than taking into a white cube. How does the city itself react to the heritage is super incredibly important. And I think we'll, we'll talk more about this in the later stage. Um, yeah. So our final panelist is Dr. Zahra Hussain. Uh, she is an architect and human geographer with more than 10 years of research and teaching experience in Pakistan and the UK. She has taught at NCA and has delivered workshops on architecture and spatial mapping in Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and the UK. Currently, she is a guest lecturer at the UCL Urban Lab, and she has co-led multiple UKRI-funded projects on themes of climate, culture, and conflict. Her work explores forms of engagement with changing landscapes amidst large infrastructural development and climate change. Uh, Dr. Zahra, we're so happy to have you here. If you could share a few words with us about your work and just contribute to our discussion. Thank you. Um, I'll discuss a project that I initiated back in 2012. I called it the Academy for Democracy. Um, and then I'm going to elaborate upon that a little bit to say how we've been trying to engage with heritage and culture through this project. So I'm going to make Okay, so I'm going to make a few points before I discuss the uh, the project. So my first point is basically um, that there are certain assumptions about heritage that get naturalized in the processes and procedures through which heritage is labeled and defined. And within academia, heritage is largely understood through the frames of Western elite cultural values, which are then unquestionably applied universally. So in this context, heritage is seen as monumental by experts limited to specific sites and objects and managed in a way that reinforces certain ideologies about what qualifies as heritage, focusing on, you know, generally historical or aesthetic aspects while ignoring its um, broader context and the landscape. So this tends to disrupt and ignore the multiple meanings and essence of heritage, the people that associate with it and the temporalities in which it operates. My second point is about temporality of heritage. And I think uh, Chris um, and Kasmi Saab has, have also kind of elaborated upon that and how our modes of engagement and knowledge production fuel a very modern sense of heritage inherited from the Western canon. So modernity has a very special relationship with heritage where the crisis of the passing time bears heavily upon the heritage which needs to be arrested against change and decay. So in the process of my work, I've been you know, exploring the entanglements of time, practices and landscapes, focusing on how heritage is created and shaped through the practices of everyday lives, rooted in the local lived um, contexts and lives of communities. <clears throat> and my third point is about who gets to narrate and define whose world in terms of what is deemed worthy of conservation. So heritage isn't something that's there or something that we find, rather it's produced through a set of procedures and something we create through categorization and regulatory steps. So these steps turn objects, buildings, or landscapes into certified heritage. In the process of my work, I engage with multiple stakeholders to surface multiple meanings and essence of heritage uh, that holds communities, you know, both human and non-human together. So in order to engage with these debates, I felt it important to cultivate an epistemic practice that puts its participants in a position to meaningfully engage with the context and environments that they are placed in. And by here, I am speaking about uh, students and universities. So in spirit, this project is aligned with um, Spivak's concept for an aesthetic education, which sets out the task for training the imagination for epistemological performance, placing great importance on cultivating the imagination of the students 
um, in particular from the discipline of humanities or the arts in which I've been teaching for a very long time and ask how can we become more accountable to the worlds we study. And here, you know, she Spivak uh, says that, you know, democracy cannot merely mean that an unskilled worker becomes skilled. Uh, it must mean that every citizen can govern and that the society places him, even if so abstractly, in a general condition to achieve this. So the Academy for Democracy is concerned with how this condition might be produced within the current academic environment of the arts and humanities, where the student is trained to actively and critically engage with the environment through imagination, rather than ha habits formed through transmitted structures of knowledge production. So this is uh, the... I call this the large word <clears throat> visiting school, and this is designed as an on-site intervention that brings together students or you know, academics, practitioners, and local communities. And it seeks to experiment in ways uh, in which students may be enabled to recognize and better respond to the worlds that they interact with or the landscapes and the people. Um, and this may involve temporary displacement from the worldviews that they are attuned to, because this is an interdisciplinary visiting school and you have people coming in from uh, different uh, backgrounds. So you have environmentalists, you have architects, you have musicians, or you have uh, uh, geologists. And then when you work together, you kind of see how these different, uh, there are different ways of seeing the world and how could you learn from those ways and where could these come together and how could we um, build a shared or a divergent understanding of the landscape that we are seeking to understand. So I set up these visiting schools in the Hindu Kush Himalaya mountain region, looking at how the natural and cultural landscapes are heavily entangled and are grappling with various challenges to their landscape, such as large infrastructural uh, projects and pressures of tourism uh, recently, and then climate change, of course. So we've been using uh, multiple methodologies um, of doing this um, and in trying to engage with and collaborate with local communities to understand what heritage means to them yeah, wow. and how they sort of uh, engage with it. So we, we sort of uh, engage with local elders. We talk to the makers, the craftspeople, or, you know, just really try to understand what's going on in a community um, and um, observing what's happening and then carrying out maybe, you know, transect walks or improvised mapping tools or relational diagrams to see how heritage is entangled in the material and immaterial processes of life and what really holds important for local communities in terms of what they um, feel should be preserved or conserved. <clears throat> So we come up with these, you know, different maps of trying to understand what the landscape is like and how it sort of, um, you know, interacts with the everyday lives of local communities. And in trying uh, to make these maps, we try to see what is uh, what is being forged in terms of alliances, what is being severed in terms of the um, infrastructural projects or development projects that are happening. So how are communities really sort of trying to, um, you know, uh, have a sense of community um, within the disruptions that are, um, you know, introduced by uh, development projects. So with this, what we're able to do is field research and documentation, but then there is also an aspect of architecture design. Um, and then there is some work that we have uh, tried to do with the research that we've done with the communities to um, develop some uh, policy recommendations or guidelines or architecture bylaws, which have uh, really been drafted in uh, collaboration with local communities. So in the course of our work, we've been seeing heritage emerging in objects and crafts, in practices and skills, in the natural landscape itself, knowledges of the folk and unseen, or buildings or, or part of buildings, which may not be remarkable, but are very significant for, for the local community. And um, in doing this, we've been also developing a practices and patterns catalog, um, highlighting how communities are engaging with their landscapes and the way these uh, relations are changing over time and what they have to grapple with in terms of climate change um, and infrastructural development in these areas. Um, and we build these maps of relations to try to see how certain things are connected to other things and what might a certain uh, intervention project um, have detrimental effects on certain kinds of relations that the community has. Um, we've also sort of worked with local communities to develop 
community heritage museums that are um, set, set up by them. So it's not so it's not something that we have um, sort of um, initiated as an idea, but this is this was a museum that was already there, and uh, the local um, the owner wanted to sort of um, develop it into his collection into a museum, and we sort of helped him do that, but trying to use local materials to do it. Um, and then uh, this work has also sort of helped us set up a community conservation lab, which is now based in Skardu, where I am at the moment. Um, and this lab is dedicated to identifying and documenting mountain heritage and produce guidelines and methods. So we're really sort of uh, working with local masons and carpenters and beavers and makers really to see um, how they are uh, engaging with their landscapes and maintaining their heritage in particular ways. And that is sort of, um, that really sort of speaks to this idea of uh, heritage and temporality and how we sort of need to uh, embrace change and decay in different ways. Um, and then there's this other um, mapping strategy that I've been using for a very long time in these uh, communities that has helped me sort of see uh, relations at a very micro level in terms of a, on the, of a room in a house, but on the um, on terms of a landscape level as well. Um, and we've been able to sort of um, look at relations between climate, terrain, materials, and local practices, looking at the character form of the built environment and how that sort of interacts with the um, environments, and then also kind of uh, trying to understand what are the entities and their capacity to affect and be affected uh, in the ways that we uh, design our interventions in these landscapes. And lastly, I would say uh, we developed these um, collage building bylaws and codes in Kalash Valley in, com um, in collaboration with local communities and Qazis and, um, you know, these local stakeholders so soldiers sort of came together. This was a project that was um, sort of um, initiated by the local government, but um, I sort of asked them that, you know, the way to go about it would be to uh, engage with local communities and really just you know conducting workshops with them to understand what built environment means to them and what their local landscape means to them in order to understand what would be the best way of uh, making bylaws that they would like to abide by rather than us telling them that you know they should do this because uh, generally what happens in the projects that the governments do is, you know, copy paste bylaws from one place to another, and then that doesn't really make any sense. So this was a very interesting, a very good learning activity for us as well in trying to see um, how we could develop bylaws. And then we could see that, you know, it was becoming very difficult to kind of um, confine ourselves only to, to houses or to buildings. We really had to look at the entire landscape in order to make... Zara, um... Your work, I mean, I, it really makes me think about the idea of survey, how the survey notion is is attached to documentation and looking at heritage. And I knew that I would like to invite you and to talk about the methodology of how to work in a, in a context which is like so sensitive and has like a very important indigenous um, knowledge and as well as heritage, which is so grassroots level. And um, in the last two, three years working in, in, in the mountains and, and looking at like clients buying this rapid when, uh, I think when, when the, the, the ownership of land require, uh, recruitment of uh, tourism was opened up in the mountains, there was a whole chaos that took place and this immediate like urge to buy um, from the urban centers to these grounds was quite uh, problematic and it was bothersome. Okay, what was the relationship with this, this making of tourism aspect, this madness, and then this heritage as a as a as a corridor or a or a back end thing. So uh I mean, you know, your work is so important. Um and to and to look at the methodologies that you are using with the community and putting out a people's museum rather than like a state based. So thanks for sharing that. Um, really appreciate it. So we have a set of questions uh, for all the speakers and, and, and please jump in, even if it's like a conversation style. And if you want to respond to each other's work, um, we're open to that. And we will be taking some questions from the audience. If you would like to speak up, please like put your, um, you can raise your hand or we will, we will then um, ask and, and open the mic for you then. Okay, thanks. For uh, Dr. Zara and then anyone else who wants to answer. Um, first of all, I absolutely loved your presentation. I just thought it was so fascinating, especially the the maps that you showed. I've never seen maps like that. 
Um, but going on to my actual question, which is related to this, uh, one of the first things that you mentioned was uh, these the three things that you mentioned at the start, which were, you know, against universality and the temper, you know, how heritage is all, of, you know, those, sorry, those three, the how, how is temporary and uh, who gets to narrate. Um, the stuff that I've learned in, for example, the anthropology classes that I've been in uh, is a very present question of how ethnocentric are our methodologies and how ethnocentric, you know, is academia usually and what influence does the West have on our practices? Uh, and more than that, you know, then questions of how to make maps, how do we include communities within um, within our surveys, within uh, kind of like our academic practice, practices, within uh, what we understand and uh, evaluate and uh, what, what constitutes the heritage that we kind of like uh, put together in, you know, um, maps, et cetera, in our archives. Um, so in, ter in, in the context of that, uh, firstly, um, what are your views on kind of like how you choose to include the communities, like local communities within your practices? Second, uh, what impact do you think language has then uh, in both these settings, in both like fieldwork settings? I, I don't know if you- Engagement. Yes. Yeah, so um, there are different ways in which the communities get involved. And by communities, I'm not saying the whole community, but, you know, people who are willing to engage with us whilst we're in the field. Uh, there is, you know, some people that we, uh, in you know, invite to our workshops, but then there's some people we come across when we're walking in the in the streets or in the villages, or then, then there's some people that we come across when we're, um, you know, visiting their fields or when we're going, going up the mountain. So, so it's not very, uh, as, so in terms of the visiting school um, and the activities that we've been doing for the last like 14 years through the visiting schools, the, um, the engagement with local communities is really sort of um, spontaneous, but also something that, you know, um, in our workshops, we sort of invite them to come over and have a discussion with us. But one of the really uh, sort of rewarding, I would say, um, experience with local communities has been that once the visiting school comes to an end, and everybody has sort of, um, you know, worked on their research, and then they've come up with their ideas. We invite local elders and local, uh, you know, elderly women and other local stakeholders to come and do like a jury session with our students. So the students present their work to them, and then the, you know, community is in a uh, position to sort of criticize or, you know, ask more questions or maybe correct them in terms of how they're thinking about their ideas of development. So, so that that I I would say is the most rewarding uh, experience within the visiting school, and that's where the community also feels really um, uh, involved and engaged, and and you know they're actually quite glad that uh, the students have sort of put in a lot of time and effort in trying to understand what their landscapes mean and what their practices are and and uh, what matters to the community. So, and on the point of um, language, in some cases, yes, it's very difficult. Um, it, there is stuff that is lost in translation and becomes very, very frustrating at times, uh, especially when you're trying to get the essence of uh, how they're dealing with certain things, you know, certain intangible or immaterial experiences. So that's where it gets a bit frustrating, but... Um, but then, you know, you can't really, we, we also uh, proceed with this idea that you can't really understand everything. So you have to sort of uh, move ahead with these uh, ambiguities and sort of um, remain humble and try to kind of work with these, with, with these gaps. So I would say that um, a lot of people do speak Urdu and they do understand English in the northern areas, but then in places where they don't, we just have to sort of work with gestures and, and you know, uh, general ethics and kindness. Thanks. Directed towards uh, Ms. Shandra Jani. Uh, I think something I found interesting is like this comment you made near the end of your sort of piece where you're talking about how even well-intentioned academics through their use of these maps that are sort of created by the state and have these bank spaces on them can sort of be complicit in the actions that are being taken there. Uh, my question was more directed insofar as there are academics that exist in that recognize that what can they do because i can't imagine there's not there's like a lot of alternatives for maps like these available to these people especially in work that is sort of unrelated towards this sort of space that is a really good question and yeah i i 
I am also very much implicated myself in these reproductions. Um, and yeah, I think where I where I can say from my own experience, I have begun is just a becoming aware of this, um, right? That that is really the first step towards uh, thinking about what a remedy can be. Uh, and second has just been, um, I mean, I think we can, yes, maps are really crucial to the ways in which we think about the world and especially maybe even with the work that PCCC does with kind of, yeah, heritage applications and yeah, maps are really often a requirement. But I think it does matter the ways in which we make a map. And I think once we become aware of the politics and the violence of the map, I think there are ways of um, not completely avoiding, but being more careful. So there are different ways of mapping. Perhaps you don't uh, use the empty, empty blank page as a given. Uh, maybe there are ways in which um, to always signal where places are, where people have been. Uh, I'm not sure. It's a really good question. Um, and But I, I feel like to say that, oh, how do we avoid this is a bit of a cop out. And I think it is all of our responsibilities to give this thought. And I also feel that often these things are very much trial and error. Nothing is, no representation is ever pure. So we are bound uh, to do things that are, yeah, replicating these systems that exist, but I think it is on us to try, um, even if we don't find the perfect method, but I think imperfect ways of trying have been really good for me at least. Yeah, I don't, I guess that's, yeah, that's all I have really. But maybe as yeah, someone else from the speakers would like to respond to that, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, Shalana, I mean, to this, I wish one could show your clip on um, the film that you had uh, made. I recently had seen at Habib University where this um, uh, one of the community members is mapping and, and you're working with them. I mean, that's such an important um, part, like if you could show it later on uh, to the students and see like how people respond. Uh, to account of, like you know how you said that the word is like so you want to avoid using it but still you want to you, you can't get away with it so counter mapping in that way yeah thank you for reminding that I, I actually feel yeah so drawing is a really powerful method uh, to countering this kind of really regularized um, satellite bordered map that when you see people from different communities communities in Karachi, for instance, mapping the river or mapping uh, places and sites that don't appear on state maps. It is a really powerful gesture, yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Dr. Ali Reza or anyone else that wants to add to it. Um, so you talked about how universities are increasingly becoming like corporatized and like simply managerial and um and even Ms. Shahana talked about how they equally play a role um as much as like these real estate agencies or um you know billionaire ty well, tycoons business tycoons that are um involved in land grabbing etc cetera, etc cetera. um but we never really like bring academia um or academics to the same level as that so that was a very um intriguing thing to hear but my question would be that how um all, like we know that um academia and academics are we do know that they're very systematically elitist, especially in our country. And so by default, a lot of a large um percentage of people are automatically cut out of these discussions and this discourse, um, which is obviously like uh, unproductive considering it's like the large pro proportion of people that needs to be involved in these discussions regarding city planning and urban development, uh, heritage preservation, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is that how can academics and even students for that matter um, sort of reconcile this gap between this system and the structure that is so elitist and like while our intention would is and would be to like help those communities and make it um on like for local communities and 
below from uh, the lower ground, but our, the system is such that it is very exclusive. So what role and how um, can academics and students for that matter make it more so it's more accessible and open and less and more inclusive to those communities and those people? Um, no, thank you for that question. It's something that we grapple with ourselves. Um, and I think that I am facing a like a similar difficulty as, as Shahana, which is to say that uh, in some ways, uh, these are big questions for us to consider. And uh, we don't always have um, a response. Uh, we may have a series of responses. We may have, we may have uh, fragmented responses, uh, but ultimately those are imperfect responses, which I'm also um, kind of okay with. So um, I would say that this space uh, is part of that possibility that you just spoke about uh, itself. Um, you know, just like sharing the space right now um, with, with scholars, with artists, with practitioners. Uh, I learned a lot um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, uh, and I think Shahana also touched upon that, which is to say that uh, that these are also the communities that that we have to nourish and to build um, and to and to work with, uh, and and not be reliant ultimately uh, on kind of you know the academy. Uh, but and 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 I, and I and I came from the position pretty much as 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 someone who 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 you know has been uh, is not just a part of the academy, uh, but also feels that a lot of expectation is laid before the academy uh, as if it's, it's some kind of a savior kind of like institution. Um, and 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 my only point was that the academy is also uh, complicit in many ways, uh, and 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 that's pretty much it. Um, beyond that, I don't have much to add, so I think I'll stop there. But but ultimately, I think that uh, you know, just like echo what Shahana said, uh, which is to think about uh, other spaces in addition to the academy. I'm not saying we should do away with it, uh, but think of those other spaces. We have to think of those other spaces, nourish those other spaces, and to collectively build those other spaces. Uh, and Chris also alluded to uh, those spaces that also democratize and even out uh, those kind of like hierarchies. Um, so I guess I'm just echoing what they said. Um, not really a great response, but ultimately I, I, I suspect that that's, that's a collective reflection for us to for us to engage in. I think I'll stop there. Chris, would you like to reflect on the same question? I mean, in any way? Um... Yeah, I, I, I agree with what uh, Ali responded. Um, and I guess the kind of tenor of my kind of contribution today was about, um, yeah, managing expectations about what academics can actually do. Um, but I also don't want that to be a kind of um, excuse for not doing anything, which is, I guess, why I think it's important for us to work against some of those um, you know, ways in which uh, universities are fractured from cities and from publics in the ways that my co-panelists have talked about. Um, and um, yeah, that looks different in different places and according to different political projects. Um, but it's something that, um, yeah, it's part of an academic responsibility. Um, it's not without risk. It's not without kind of, um, depending on you know uh, professional risk um or or otherwise um but i think that that's sort of the the idea of academic responsibility that i i like to place myself within and inhabit um and and yeah um recognize um that is part of my work basically Thanks, Chris. We'll just take two more questions. I'm aware of the time frame. So, uh, Midhat, why don't you go ahead and then we'll have another question um, by, we have Minahel. Okay. Okay. So, my question was for uh, Dr. Ali Raza, but like anyone can answer it. Um, you talked about the humanities um, in universities and how you see a devaluation of that. How would you say that interacts with like the rapid expansion of universities in Pakistan, especially as you see that a lot of these institutions seemingly prioritize or at least claim to put place a lot of priority like on these like subjects? How would you like reconcile the two, I guess? Yeah. Um, 
I think other people can also jump into this, but I think that, uh, well, A, there are a lot of um, considerations into what that go into this, this the, that have gone into this mushrooming of, of, of the higher education sector. Now, in many cases, it's become a, a great way to siphon off uh, of, of, of development money. Uh, but leaving that aside, I think it's perfectly kind of like aligned with that larger, uh, in some ways, design, I would say, uh, by which the humanities have been systematically been devalued, which, which is to say that um, that there's a lot more emphasis on producing uh, what are considered to be uh, valued skills uh, and valued professionals. Uh, and so uh, every so, for, so let's say engineering, uh, the sciences, medicine, and so on. Uh, and so there's a lot more emphasis on those subjects, which are seen as, uh, you know, subjects that are essential to a country's development and so on. Uh, so in that, in that larger scheme of things, I mean, uh, historians obviously are useless when it comes to building bridges uh, or roads. Uh, we can't save lives. Uh, in fact, we can't do much at all. Um, you know, uh, so so that kind of like so in that hierarchy of values, uh, in that hierarchy of utility, uh, humanity people, you know, become pretty much at a lower end. So in that sense, uh, it's perfectly kind of like aligned uh, with that larger mission of like you know uh, funding the higher education sector, but for the explicit purpose of producing more uh, uh, skilled professionals, and by skilled, I have a very limited meaning of skill in mind. Uh, so both of those in some ways are going together. And I think that is something that is increasingly, I notice a, com a topic of conversation in the recent, in the, in the ongoing UK election campaign uh, in which, uh, you know, the right wing parties are basically making a case, making a case for defunding or reducing uh, subjects that are associated with the classics or, or literature or, or, or history and so on, uh, the soft subjects, if you will. Uh, so it's very much a global trend in that sense. No, but I'm sure Chris and uh, you know and 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 Zara and and others can also jump in. Actually, everyone, this was an incredibly insightful session. Um, I have a question for um Professor Shahana. So um, when you were talking about mapping, you talked a lot about like um centers and margins and peripheries and margins and peripheries and centers are kind of words that tend to come up very often when we're talking about cities and mapping and everything. Um, but my question is like, how do you define what a center is, what a margin is, what a periphery is? And for us to move past or like for us to look at like alternative mappings, um, do you think it's important to like let go of this vocabulary of like centers and margins and peripheries? Thank you, Manahir. Of course, um, again, I think it's like one of those things where you're so entrenched in certain vocabulary and ways of speaking that even though, of course, yes, we need to let go of the center and margin comparison, it's hard to make a point without uh, using and reproducing some language and the same with visual maps, I guess. But yes, absolutely. I think this kind of polarity between the center and periphery is what enables this unfolding of violence and this kind of colonization of our imagination. And yeah, it's through the center that through inhabiting the center that we often imagine ourselves relating to areas that are on the outskirts of the city. And that is very much a problem. So yeah, absolutely. I think the center needs to be broken and thrown down. And um, I think in my own work, I have really I have really been working in, for instance, the neighborhood of Malir for a really long time, looking at Gadap and Kathor and uh, all of these regions that uh, growing up, I didn't have so much familiarity with. And I think a big question of starting a new relationship or starting new field work is right, that kind of also thinking about ethics and responsibilities of a researcher, like, Am I meant to go here? Am I, you know, as an outsider, what am I? Should I go into this neighborhood? Does it feel right? Does it like, right? All of these questions come up of like, what does it mean for me as a researcher or artist or academic to enter the space, take up a community's time? What does it mean? And I think maybe at the beginning, like 10 years ago, yes, these questions really, really 
paralyzed me and haunted me. And I think they're still really, really at the heart of every move I make. Uh, but I think so, the more I've been working in these neighborhoods and the more I've built relationships with these communities, um, I sometimes also feel this outsider insider. Polarity is also not always so productive um, in the sense that often when communities are going through real violence, uh, the first question they or the first statement they make is, you know, so much is happening, but no one has come to see, no one is witnessing what, what has happened. Like people often sometimes in these really violent spaces want, want solidarity, want people from inside different parts of the city to come in and see, to support, to, yeah, just have those social interactions that are not so much underpinned by hope. I think hope feels not like an appropriate thing anymore in our times, but they really are underpinned by love, right? That's so much of what we are doing. If you think about hope, everything feels so hopeless, but I feel like so much of what I do and people around me do is really driven by a love for the city. It's people, um, yeah. I yeah. I guess I went on a tangent there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is from one of our audience members. Um, can looking at cities and preservation projects are, like across South Asia inform how engagement with cities and heritage is undertaken locally? Uh, like there's a lot of energy invested into Pakistan India comparisons, but there are there also valuable insights farther from the center in India, i.e., not in cities like uh, Delhi, Amritsar, Mumbai, and even elsewhere like maybe infrastructure in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. Um, basically, uh, how do comparative studies take academic concerns outside of the academy into the streets and expand our work beyond borders? Yes, uh, <clears throat> I mean I don't. Uh... Uh, work on on these themes as such, but for um, for my own understanding, I mean the problem is that when it comes to Pakistan, unfortunately, there is not a lot of um, academic literature. So so even for for my own work on on Lahore, for instance, on trying to understand the conceptual categories such as walking and so on and so forth, I have to do a lot of borrowing from Indian scholars. You know the way they have looked at. Delhi, Calcutta, Bombay, and you know they, it's it's fantastic work. Um, trying to understand like what is the difference between let's say a street and a road. How is it? What does it mean to do bazaar in Delhi? You know, um, how is it that uh, the uh, you know these categories that we use like uh, flanor, you know, like how is it that it's uh, in a postural context? It does not mean the same thing, and you know there is no there is no detached idle walker as such, right? So, so in, in that sense, uh, there is a lot more sort of like uh, work which is being done where people are looking at these things more uh, creatively, I would say, um, in case of uh, in case of Indian cities. And um, in terms of practices, policies, I'm sure uh, I'm Dr. Zara Hussain and, uh, um, and others have a lot to say that in terms of when it comes to government practice, perhaps it's it's no... Is no better than us, perhaps. You know, when you look at the the way in which uh, the new uh, the new imperial sort of like uh, capital in in Delhi has been planned, um, and uh, the the artistic and historical choices that they are making to tell a story about the Indian um, Empire or Indian state as such, right? So it's uh, maybe it's it's not and the the way um, uh, renovation has been carried out in case of. Uh, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know the, the uh, Varansi, for instance, right? So the whole idea is that we will make a Paris out of Varansi, right? So that that kind of like uh, 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 when it comes to state practice, you know, perhaps the the ambition or the vision is is also very very uh, westernized in in that sense. But uh, but yeah, I mean, still there is uh, there there's still uh, a lot one can learn from uh, from from Indian scholarship. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's the end to our question answer session. I'd just like to thank all the speakers so much for being here and taking the time out of your day to help us with this session. Uh, it was an incredible session. I'm sure everyone took away something from each of these speakers. Just a quick conclusion before we start talking about our next session and we end this meeting. 
uh, just some thoughts on everything that happened is today we learned like about how academia plays a role in shaping the city's landscape. We talked about how like university sort of mushroomed post, you know, post colonization because of state incentives and how that exists alongside the devaluation of humanities. We talked about how institutions like these tend to capitalize on biased map making. And we learned a little bit about how these maps can also create an alternative perspective where you can accommodate new constructions like the orange line and sort of visualize new connections that these buildings create and sort of some takeaways that you can have from that. We learned about laws and perspectives and how these should be shaped around the communities that you are sort of uh, engaging with and how academia can play a role in sort of connecting these two communities. And like one other thing that we sort of learned is how histories of these spaces are sort of visible if you look closely enough and the role that academia academia plays in immortalizing these things. So stuff like Nehru Park and talking about how the name was removed from that place and how stuff like uh, Lawrence's statue was sort of torn down in like anti-colonialist uh, like politics and stuff like that. Uh, the next session we're going to have is going to be about social media's role in safeguarding heritage. That's going to be on the 28th of June, 2024, which is this Friday. It's 5.30 to 7 p.m. Pakistani time. And we're going to have speakers like Ghazi Temur, Abu Sufyan and Sayyid Kazim Kasmi. Uh, so that's going to be a great session. We hope to see all of you guys there. Uh, that's it for this session. Thank you all so much once again.